All right, so why don't we get going back with the story? Everybody's sort of with it at this point. We've got this, this is New York State, New York State, and, and some more. New York State is basically formed by these glacial events, a series of them, four of them. The latest one was the Wisconsin one. The Wisconsin one basically covered the entire state except for this little section over here, which is called the Salamanca Retrenchment. Okay? And we've started talking about how these glaciers, where they form, they started up in these northern latitudes, and basically we have pack of snow, pack of snow, pack of snow, the snow packs down, and the ice starts to flow. As it packs, it turns into ice. It's not like the ice cubes that you make in the freezer. It's a very different type of creature. Okay? The snowflakes basically keep packing, keep packing. They get heavier and heavier, heavier. They build up and they build up, and as they build up, they start pushing things out. Okay? And that's what we're looking at this slide. Okay? It flows like water. It is water. It's just solid water. Okay? It you can see the flow paths and you can see where there's resistance points and it's going to make these grooves. It's going to follow the, e the path of least resistance like the rest of us, right? Okay? This is what that structure looks like. This is what these ice sheets look like. Okay? Now this, is, this one's receding, but as it moves forward, it's going to be grinding and pushing everything in front of it. And as it goes down through valleys and stuff like that, as it goes down through valleys, thing, as it carves out below, things are going to fall on top of it. Okay? And things are going to be entrained inside it. And things are going to be pushed in front of it. And things will be trailing by the side of it. And there will also be things inside of it. Okay? You can imagine this is ice. You have a summer event, your crevasse will fill or open up, water will start flowing. I mean, it's summertime, ice melts, okay? As the water flows, it moves through the ice, underneath the ice, and on top of the ice, and it's going to entrain things with it. So imagine this is this big, basically, bulldozer, okay? Except the material is all over. It's underneath it, it's on the sides of it, it's inside it, it's on top of it, it's in front of it. Now, this is Greenland here, sort of the last of the continental sort of glaciers, except for Antarctic, at least in the north, northern hemisphere. Basically, here's the leading edge, and you can sort of see how it's sort of folded over. You see all these little crevasses in it. These are the cracks. It's not a solid block of ice, okay? It's pieces. They're connected. They freeze. They thaw. They freeze. They thaw. They grow. They shrink. It's moving all the time. Now this is the extent of that glacier in New York. Now this went, so here you're looking at sort of as a line graph, okay? This line, the terminal or the front end, the farther south this glacier went, is this line right here. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, now what happens? The glacier gets up to its farthest extent and something climatically shifts and the glacier doesn't continue to push forward or it pushes as far south as it can with the heat that's to the south. And so as a result, the ice moves this far, it starts melting here. It's still pushing forward though, but it's just melting at that front. The front is basically stabilized. Does that make sense? And that was that term that I called dynamic equilibrium, being pushed forward and it's melting at the same rate. Okay? And there are a series of these dynamic equilibriums. Okay? The climate is getting warmer. Okay? If the climate's getting warmer, the ice front is going to recede because it can't push up as far as it was before. But it's going to reach a series of sort of these dynamic equilibriums where it can push up to a certain point and it melts. And it lasts there for a couple decades, or a couple hundred years, or a couple thousand years. And then it melts back a little bit more. Now, it's not like it stops at this line. There's a shift back and forth. But there's a series of these dynamic equilibriums from the front point. And in all likelihood, before it got here, there were a series of equilibriums as it advanced. The problem is that we can't identify those because the minute the ice advances over that location of dynamic equilibrium, it basically destroys all the stuff that's been dropped. So if this ice has been pushing forward and it melts here, all that stuff that's entrained in the ice 
underneath, on the sides, on the top, in the front, and in are all dropped because they're not in the ice anymore. Does that make sense? Now, if I continue as an ice sheet and I advance over that, I'm basically going to entrain that stuff up again. On the other hand, if I don't advance anymore and I start retreating, all that stuff is left behind. Does that make sense? That is Long Island. Long Island was the furthest south that glacier sheet got. And it stayed there for a long time. And as that ice pushed forward, it just kept dropping more and more and more of Long Island. And it turns out that Long Island actually has two what we call terminal moraines. One is called the Harbor Hill, and one is called the Reconcoma. You know the eastern side of Long Island? It's called the Twin Forks. Does this sound familiar? Let me go back to this. Actually, you can see it on this slide right here. You see that there's one, two Twin Forks. Each one of those is one of those moraines. And I do not know off the top of my head which is this farther south. Okay, does that make sense? Now, has anybody been to New York City? Okay, has anybody been to Staten Island? Between Brooklyn and Staten Island is the Verrazano Bridge. Okay, Brooklyn and Staten Island at one time were the same island. <coughs> what happened was, as this ice retreats, it melts. And when it melts, there's a lot of water coming off of it. Well, that water basically, through a series of breakouts, cut a hole right through that island. If you look at the Verrazano Bridge, just to give you an idea how big this gap is, if you look at the Verrazano Bridge, there's two basically pylons. It's a suspension bridge. Okay, there's two pylons that come up and the cable between them and they hang the roadbed underneath them. It turns out that the tops and the bottoms are separated farther apart. Okay, so the top is farther apart than the bottom. Part of that is due to engineering. But part of that is due to the curvature of the Earth. That hole is that big. There was so much water running through there. OK, does that make sense? Just to give you an idea about how much water material we're talking about. OK, so here's the southernmost exp ex expanse of it, the extent of it. Now, this ice started retreating. Now, this extent was about 23,000 years ago. And the ice started retreating back. Okay. Right about here, you got a series of most of the water. This is sort of the southern tier, the high elevations to the south of us. The ice can go uphill, too, because it's being pushed from behind. Okay? So right here, we have a series of dynamic equilibriums. This backs up a little bit more. Right about here. Backs up some more. Right about here. Now, the issue between this one this is just to the south of us, those high elevations to the south of us. Okay. In that area, we formed a moraine there as well, this dynamic equilibrium. Prior to glaciation, all the rivers and lakes and streams to the north of this divide basically flowed south. What happened was, when this dynamic equilibrium formed, and deposited the moraine that was in there, it basically created dams. So there are a series of earthen dams that basically run along this line. Now, all of the streams north of this line basically run north because of those dams. Okay? Now, you can see that. And I, saw this, I know this slide is a little thi thin, but notice this zone right in here. This is actually a lake. It's a very large lake, and basically it ran between the glacier to the north and the high elevations to the south, the dam. All of the valleys, you know where Wegmans is and all that kind of stuff? All of those valleys were basically lake. College Town is basically where the beach was. Okay? Buffalo Hill, you know, Buffalo Street going down, you know what I'm talking about? Okay? That is actually a stream bed that was formed underwater. Now, if it was a stream bed that was formed above water, you'd never have that kind of steepness. Why? Because the angle of repose, the bearing strength of that material wouldn't be able to have that kind of steep nature. It would have to be like this. So when you look at these types of streams, the steepness of the stream tells you how it was formed. It had to have been formed underwater, 
and it was formed when this lake was here. Does that make sense? OK. <coughs> this was about 15 to 10,000 years ago. OK. When it was down here, it was 23,000 years. So you can do the math, and you can figure out how long it took to melt back to here. OK. Melted back farther. Another lake is formed. This is Lake Mayberry. This is Lake Hall. Okay. As the ice recedes, openings to the east and west open up, and the lake level basically can escape. Okay. It starts by escaping literally down the Mississippi. And then it goes down <coughs> basically the Hudson as this ice recedes. And ultimately, as it does now, it basically goes down the St. Lawrence <coughs> out to the Atlantic. Why? OK, well, imagine this. <coughs> if I have a landscape that to the south of me, I have a hill. OK, so this is north. OK, to the north of me, I have a glacial wall. I have a lake in between these, right? As this glacier recedes farther and farther back, there's going to be more and more outlets for this lake. Right? There's going to be lower level spots. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Chalk dust or something. <coughs> There's going to be lo more and more outlets for this lake. Now, because this south is higher elevation and the north is higher elevation, the outlets are going to be east and west. Does that make sense? So as a result, <coughs> So as a result, <coughs> these breakouts go easterly or westerly. Or easterly or westerly. Sorry, let me do that. OK. Now, <coughs> remember me talking about Staten Island and Long Island, right? And that breakout, that hole that was basically driven by water? Well, what happens is the ice recedes enough that the water can escape down this valley that was basically formed by the ice and this river. And basically, a lot of water pours down this gap and punches a hole right through the drumlin, or not the drumlin, the terminal moraine, which is Staten Island and Long Island, punches a hole and basically makes the Hudson River, Hudson River Channel. Does this make sense to everybody? Sort of, ish? I know a lot everybody knows New York City, but does that make sense? OK, let me. Uh, <clears throat> I see some days looks. OK, so New York State, basically like that, OK? Hudson Valley, Finger Lakes here, all right? So New York City sits right here. Long Island looks something like this. Manhattan is something like this. So this is Queen, uh, <clears throat> Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. OK, and New Jersey's over here. OK, and then there's Sandy Hook out here. OK, the Hudson River basically goes like this. All right? At one time, this was basically one island. Somewhere down the line, the ice recedes enough that the water can escape down the Hudson River, which is this. That water comes as a huge wall of water, and it hits this wall of dirt. It breaks it open, and now we have a bridge there. Does that make sense? OK. Ultimately, this ice keeps receding, keeps receding. Ultimately, we have the breakout, not here at this point. Ultimately, we have the breakout that goes up and out the St. Lawrence, up to the, what we call the Champlain Sea at the time. And we basically see what we, uh, we basically have the landscape that we have today. Now, there's a couple little other sort of zings to this story. First, you can see this sort of this Champlain Sea. There's no Champlain Sea there now. Why? Well, if you think about all of the ice that is sitting on top of this land, it's actually pretty heavy. Anybody have any idea how thick these glaciers can get? Continental glaciers. Any idea? Two miles. Two miles. Two miles of ice. It's a lot of ice cubes for your drink. Okay? 
Imagine how heavy that is. It turns out that it is so heavy that it actually pushes the continental plate down into the magma. It pushes it down, okay? And as it melts, what we have is called what's called glacial rebound. As it melts, the plate starts to rise back up. It's like the buoyancy of a boat. If you take a couple people out of the boat, the boat starts rising, right? Okay. Except this boat's a little bit different. This boat is really big. So if I got a lot of people in this boat and I just take the people out of the front of the boat, just the bow of the boat is going to rise. Does that make sense? Okay. And so what's going to happen as the ice melts, the boat is differentially going to rise at the melting end first and then it's going to rise at the other end. Now, the ice was here about 10,000 years ago. It turns out that the plate is still rising. The St. Lawrence Seaway, they are dredging the St. Lawrence Seaway because of sediment buildup. But part of that issue is actually not the sediment buildup, it's the plate coming back up. When the ice was here and the ice dam was there, the was actually here. It wasn't fresh water. It wasn't the St. Lawrence. It was actually the Atlantic Ocean, an arm of the Atlantic Ocean coming all the way in to basically Canada and New York. We have whale skeletons. We can find whale skeletons up there. Okay, they don't, obviously they come into fresh water, but these kinds of whales and sharks and things like that are not freshwater organisms. So we have evidence for this being there. Okay? So, how do you like the story so far? Great. Not, <laughs> great, awesome. <laughs> um, so let's take this story and let's start talking about what it actually means to soils or the landscape that we're talking about. And let's talk about the valleys that we have around here. Now, when you guys usually draw a valley, I mean, this is like kindergarten, when you guys were drawing valleys or you know hills and things like that, usually you drew something that looked like this. I mean, just draw a little, oval, another oval, another oval. And it turns out that that's the kind of valley that's really formed by streams. Streams, they start carving in and they'll start notching in, notching in, notching in. And they make curves, nice little round curves. All right? The valleys that we have around here, if they are going north and south, are shaped like this, are shaped like U's. Well, why? If the glaciers are moving north-south, what happens is, unlike the water, liquid water, the ice basically carves out the edges. Let me go back to this slide. Now, this is a montane glacier. But look at how this ice is moving down this valley. It's not moving at a point. It's moving over an entire zone. OK, so imagine this. Here's my valley. This is what it was, OK? And ice starts moving down it, OK? It starts not that big, but what is it going to do? It's going to carve out not just the bottom, but it's going to carve out all the sides. Does that make sense? And as the ice gets thicker, it's going to do the same thing. And as it gets thicker, it's going to do the same thing. Does that make sense? So that when the ice leaves, you're left with a shape like that. Now, this only applies if the valley is a north-south valley. Now, you guys remember me saying, prior to glaciation, all the streams and most of the streams, but basically all the water drains south. That means there's a lot of north-south valleys that are basically carved out. You guys have seen a picture of the Finger Lakes, right? Every one of the Finger Lakes is a product of this, OK? Imagine to the south of me, OK, you guys are to the south. I'm far to the north. The south of me, you guys are wall. The water is not going that way anymore. To the north of me is higher elevations. What's going to happen to the water? It's going to fill up these valleys. Does that make sense? And so as a result, we have the Finger Lakes, OK? Now, what does that mean for the material that's in these places? 
And also, what does this mean for the east-west valleys? Not all the valleys went north-south. Some of the valleys went east-west. Now imagine, I, let's go back to this valley here. Okay, and I have a stream that's coming out this way. Okay, but imagine I have a stream that's going down this way. Okay, what's going to happen to those streams? And all of a sudden I have a waterfall here. Does that make sense? Sort of. It's called a hanging valley. Anybody been to Gigantic Park yet? That stream comes off, hits that cut, and drops. Salmon Creek, does that one sound familiar to anybody? Taganic is on the west side of the lake. Salmon Creek is basically on the east side of the lake. Okay, basically the same thing happens here. Now, interestingly, it's a little bit different than just cutting it through. If I have an east-west valley, okay, I'm going to do this. This is going to be an up. You're going to be looking down at the profile. Okay, so here's my streams. Okay, does that make sense? The streams are all draining this way to the south. Okay, glacier moves over this. What's going to happen? Well, anything that's going sort of pseudo north south is going to be carved out into the U Valley. What's going to happen to all the streams that are going east west? What's going to happen to that stream valley? It's going to get filled in. Okay, now the farmers around here, some farmers can tell you exactly where those stream valleys were. The soil is basically flat, but why? Well, if I have a field that happens to have been here and it got filled in by debris from the glacier, I basically have a nice drain system for my field right there because coarser material fills into this valley. It's now flat. But because of the glacier, it got filled in. It's now flat. And as a farmer, I know that this zone, because I have coarser material, it drains well. On either side, it doesn't drain so well. So they can, you can literally follow these streams by looking at the drainage, even though the stream isn't there anymore. Ultimately, this stream is going to get to a section that's north-south, so basically right here. And that's where your hanging valley is going to happen. Now, Taganic. If you look at Taganic, here's my sort of U-shape, right? Let me make this a little better. Taganic is not here, is it? When you go to Taganic, you have to walk like a mile in to get to the waterfalls, right? OK, so that waterfall is actually here. What's happened is basically the water flow has pushed out all of this debris that's been filled in. It's been knocked down here. And the waterfall has basically crept up this valley as it fill, cleans out that debris. And with the amount of water that was moving down, because I mean we had enough water to ba basically break up Long Island, you can imagine how much water was going down these streams as this ice melts, a lot of it. And that stuff is going to redistribute this material all over. The, the material, or the parent material, remember that five soil forming factors? The first one was parent material. The parent material of the soils that we have in this whole region is based on how the ice and the water move things. Does that make sense? OK, questions so far? You good? The, uh, the Waterfall. So that water is that above ground, or is that th coming through the sort of more gravelly? It started. Okay. So the so the question is, is the water actually moving through the ground, or is it actually on the surface? Is that yeah. sort of it? okay? So we got this east-west valley that got filled in. Okay. The glacier starts melting, and it has these pipes. It's got you know, it's it's got this nice valley that's got lots of water flow through it because it's coarse material. Well, the water starts moving through that very fast and basically starts pushing things out of the way. Has anybody, does, any, does everybody know where Flat Rocks is? Does anybody know where Flat Rocks is? Flat Rocks is uh, sort of a swimming hole that's up creek, uh, actually right where the Cornell water plant is. Okay. Usually it's a pretty benign, quiet little stream. But I would like you guys, if you ever, ever get the opportunity, after a spring flood, 
go there and basically listen to the stream. You don't have to, you can watch too, but listen to the stream. You can hear rocks grinding through that, the amount of flow. About two year, three years ago, we had a really major event, and you would come down that, you'd go over to that stream and look at it, not the listening part, you could hear the grinding, but it looked like there were sharks swimming in it. Because all the, the, the rocks around here are all shale, so they're, they're flat, material sedimentary rocks. So as these pieces of rock get stripped off, they come off in big sort of plates, and the water starts tossing them around, and it comes up over the surface, and it looks like a shark fin. There's that much water going down. Now that's just a spring flood now. Imagine what was happening when you had two miles thick of ice melting. That's a lot of water. And that's a lot of energy, and it's melting fast. That's why we have this type of landscape. That's why we have these huge cores. That's why we have these hanging valleys, okay? In the next couple weeks when we go out to the field, I'm gonna be giving you sort of a geomorphic tour. I'm gonna to show you the landscape through the soils. And we're gonna to go to basically four different locations that are very distinct of this geologic or glacial sort of period. We're gonna be going to a stream bed or a stream delta. It's gonna be the highest part of the landscape. There's a stream delta at the highest part of the landscape. We're gonna be going to above the lake, so we're not gonna have any kind of lake, we're just gonna be basically looking at ice deposited material, no water sorting. We're gonna be going to a lake bottom, where you can see we're out in the middle of the lake, we're far away from any shoreline. We're actually gonna to go to the beaches, I'll take you guys to some beaches, far away from the Atlantic or the Pacific, but we're gonna to go to the beaches. And we're also gonna to go to an interface site where we can actually see the boundary between these uplands and the lake bottom itself. So you can see the differences that are formed by these different parent materials as they're laid. And then the subsequent 13, 10 to 13,000 years of environment that has then formed the soils from this initial parent material that's been deposited by the water and the ice. Okay, does that make sense? All right, is this kind of interesting at this point? I mean, it's kind of cool. I mean, this is basically driving the environment that we're seeing, okay? Now, just to give you an idea about what these features look like prior to 10,000 years of sort of happening, okay? Here is one of these glaciers going down a valley. This is a picture of the front end of it, okay? See this pile of debris? This is that moraine material. Okay, this happens to be a valley moraine, it's not like Long Island, but this is that debris pile. Here's a better picture of it. So you can see, here's the ice moving through and you can see how broken up that ice is. It's not like an ice cube, okay? And you can see this pile of material that has been pushed and deposited by this ice, okay? You can also see, if you look at the side of this valley here, you can see where the ice as well as this debris has basically scraped that side. Okay, imagine I have this side, this valley. Imagine that I have this kind of valley, okay, and I, as this ice is forming down, it's gonna be cutting in the side here. Some of that stuff is gonna be pushed in front of it, but as this undercuts the side, you can certainly imagine that some of this stuff is gonna fall on top of it, okay? And you certainly can imagine that as ice pushes through, the ice is actually gonna get also stick to the side, okay? And if it's falling on the side and the tops, and you can see how cracked and crevassed this stuff is, it's gonna make its way inside. And that's why this material is being carried, pushed, dragged, it's all. I mean, the ice is carrying it in all different kinds of ways. The glacier is sitting up here, so you're looking down, and you can basically see that valley after the glacier has passed through or has melted. This is melting back. This is basically, instead of looking at the water side, you're looking at the land side, but you're sitting on top of the glacier, you're looking down slope into the valley that the ice just was in. Now this is not a lake version, 
This is a different location than this. But you can see it's the bottom is fairly flat. And you can see all these streams and these gravel bars and just deposits of all over the place. This is the landscape that basically the Finger Lakes has been made from. Now, I put this slide back in here. You've seen this slide already. This was the extent that basically made these moraines. And see these black, all the black spots here are moraine deposits. These are those points where the ice had some period of dynamic equilibrium, where we had significant accumulations or deposits of material. This is what we call the valley head moraines. And these are the moraines that basically block the water that was going south and makes it go north and basically forms all of these finger lakes. Now, has anybody driven from here to Syracuse? You drive through and you go into a very deep valley, okay? And then the highway comes down onto the flat bottom. That valley is basically a finger lake. The problem with it, or it's not a problem, the issue with it, that's not the right word either, but um, is it's a little bit farther north and it has better drainage. Its breakout to the, to the north is a little bit lower than all these other ones. If that was not the case, that valley would be a finger lake as well. Just so you can see or imagine what this landscape really looked like. Pretty cool, pretty interesting. Okay, here is what those moraines, I don't know, can you guys see this fairly well? Is it sort of, okay. This is, you can see the, sort of the strata of where the ice deposited things. So it's these long lines of material, okay. Now this is just the front end of the ice. Okay. In some cases, the ice is going to be melting back farther, so you don't have that period of dynamic equilibrium that's going to leave this big, huge pile. Okay. There's all different kinds of features that come from ice. Now, this is a graph. It's this, this is actually from um, New York State Museum, which is in Albany. And this is basically a graph sort of showing all different kinds of glacial features. Around here, from basically here to here is what we sort of see down here in the sort of the Finger Lakes region. As you get farther up in the, these old lake beds, you get drumlins. Has anybody heard the term drumlin? Has anybody heard the term eskers? These are all very discrete features that are produced by glaciers as they melt. Okay. Drumlins are basically, I don't know, when you played with, with clay as a kid, and I don't know if you guys ever did this, you took your hand and you had the clay and you sort of pushed it up against the table and it formed like snakes and things like that. Okay. Well, if I have, my hand was, my hand is fairly flat, but if I have an ice bottom that's sort of like this, you know, and I start pushing through that clay, one can certainly imagine that I'm going to find zones, uh, my description is not going to work, let me draw this. So imagine I have this sort of all these debris fields, okay, all this material that's underneath here. Okay, and then I ride over it with ice, okay, or my hand. And my ice, my hand happens to have sort of imperfections in it because just upstream from where the ice was, there was a rock that basically formed the ice and made it an imperfection. So it's not perfectly smooth, okay. As this ice starts riding over material, you can certainly imagine that I'm going to have little high points of material and then low points of material and high points of material as this ice moves over. Does that make sense? Yeah, so go back to when you were pushing that clay with your hand and you saw that as you pushed through, you left behind little pieces, streaks of clay. Yes, kind of. Well, the same thing's happening here. And these things are basically, if so if the ice is moving this way, okay, these drumlins basically look something like this, sort of like teardrop shaped. Okay, so the ice is moving through here. The ice had some sort of imperfection in it right there that basically allow this accumulation. They are all basically oriented the flow direction of the ice. So generally north-south. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, we have another feature that's called an esker. Eskers are these long sort of serpentine, where is one? Here's an esker crossing a drumlin. Um, but they're basically sort of these serpentine, that's the only one I can see there. They're basically these serpentine paths of gravel, like a gravel bar, okay? And they can go all different directions, like that. 
and they literally are a pile of rocks like this. Okay, some of them are really big. Some of them are as big as three or four story buildings. Some of them are rather small, about as tall as I am. Okay, well, what's happening? How did that feature, I mean, you would imagine if ice is moving through this system, that kind of feature would disappear. It would be totally destroyed. Well, this is an artifact of actually what's happening inside the glacier. Remember me saying there's all different kinds of cracks and fissures. Well, every time it melts in the summertime, water starts flowing through this system in the ice. You have streams in the ice, on top of the ice, and in the ice. Okay. Well, if water is flowing, it's going to entrain all the debris that's also on that ice. So all that gravel and rocks and boulders that were in or on the ice are going to get entrained in the stream. Right? Now imagine this stream. Imagine this board is the glacier, okay? And this stream is someplace down at the bottom of a crevasse, okay? And it started here. And one can imagine that as the water flows, it's going to sort of melt a hole in this glacier, right? Does that make sense? Okay. And as it melts the hole, it's going to be entraining all this material. Now, when the flow is fast, that material is going to go where the stream goes. But as the flow starts decreasing, what's going to happen to all that material that's entrained in the water? It's going to be, it's going to drop out, right? And it's going to be deposited, and I'm going to sort of enlarge this, okay? So here's my stream, okay? And it's going to be deposited at the bottom, all this debris. Well, next year, it's going to get warm again. And more stream is going to be flowing through here. And I've got a bed. The stream's going to start moving up, right? Just like the Mississippi does every time it floods if we don't dredge, or we put dams on the side of it, dikes, whatever you want to call them, right? And it's going to start carving upward. Well, fall's going to come, and the water flow is going to slow down, and the debris field is going to be left behind, and this bed is going to keep being deposited, and it's going to keep melting, and ultimately, the stream is going to be way up here, but I have this pile of rocks that have been left behind. And it's going to follow the serpentinous route of the stream. Does that make sense? Well, what's going to happen to this debris field when the ice melts? It's going to hit the ground, right? And as a result, we have this very long sort of pile of dirt, and it literally looks like sort of a pyramid type of shape, a triangular shape, and it follows this sort of strange path, and it's called an esker. We have one of these in Six Mile Creek. It's a very small one, but it's there. You know, it's this type of material. It's just been deposited. It's a glacier, dropped the stream, and it was there. Pretty cool feature. If I had parent material coming up to here, and coming up to here, these two might be the same parent material, but this whole esker feature right in here is a totally different parent material. I automatically have two different soils just because of what the glacier was doing. Does that make sense? Cool story-ish? And I'm not actually making it up. Okay. Number of very different features. Here is that crevasse. Okay? The crevasse is filled up, the ice melts, and what am I left with behind? I'm basically this material that's been left behind that's filled into that crevice. As the ice melts, that's what's left. Here is one of those ice tunnels. Okay? Here's the ice tunnel, the stream flowing through it, ice melts away. What am I left with? An esker. Let's bring this a little bit closer to home. Okay. That's the library tower. The lib. On lib slope. The pumpkin was on top. Not then, but okay. When the glacier was here, it's basically sitting here. All of these inlet valleys were lakes. The height of that lake was above campus. 
This building that we're standing in right now is basically lake bottom. We're gonna go up to Caldwell Field, which is up not that far up the road, maybe half a mile, okay? And we are at lake bottom. Just to give you an, ex an idea about how extensive these lakes were. The Flats, Fall Creek, where all the outlet malls and stuff are, that's down there. That's lake bottom too, but it's a different lake depth. Just to give you that feature. Here is Cascadilla Creek. Okay, here someplace right about here is Buffalo Hill. No, here, right about here. And that's where Buffalo Road Street is. And that's where that Cascadilla Creek and a number of other creeks feeding debris from the uplands into this lake basically formed these stream deltas. And they formed them underwater. And that's why Buffalo Hill or Buffalo Street is so steep. Go. When you say they formed underwater, is there like low, like subsurface flow or something? Well, the if the water comes, if I got water coming off a creek and it hits that water, that water has got high energy here, hits that water, energy is going to drop off very radically. So all the big stuff is going to fall off right away. But there's still energy in that water. I mean, it's still half flow. So as the farther and farther away I get from that upland point, the smaller and smaller particles are going to still be entrained, but the larger and larger is going to fall out. So the big boulders are going to fall out here, and then gravel, and then sand, and then silt and clays are going to flow it out into the middle of the lake. And that's actually very important when you start talking about the parent materials. Here, off of Koi Glen, the landscape underneath the lake here is probably going to have coarser materials because it's got the energy here. But I get out here when I don't have some place where I don't have an outlet coming into it, I'm not going to have gravels and sands. I'm going to have silts and clays. That, when the lake disappears, is going to be the parent material from which the soil is formed. So by looking at this landscape history, I now have an understanding where the parent, ma parent material is distributed. And so as a result, I have an understanding of what's going to be in the soil. Make sense? Now for me, that's the cool part. But this whole story in general, I mean, to understand how this landscape of the Finger Lakes is formed, that's actually the bigger picture here. That's actually really what's kind of interesting. That's, I mean, I think it's cool. Not too many of you have fallen asleep yet, so I guess it's OK. But all right. OK, questions. This is a soils map of part of campus. OK, here's Forest Home. This is actually Caldwell Field up here. That's Hanshaw Road up there. So there's field crops up there, or, and there's the turf, turf farm up here. You guys know, I'm trying to give you guys some sort of reference. Here's Turf Farm right here. Uh, Dryden Road, Cascadilla Creek is here. Um, but basically what you're looking at here, this is Lake Bottom. Okay? You get up to here, and you're in the uplands. There's sand in here. There's sand here. Uh, and these are basically deltas. You get farther north, and you're into Lake Bottom. Right through in the middle here, this is all recent alluvium, stuff that's formed after the glaciers left. OK, I will take, we're going to be visiting the plantations. Has anybody been to the plantations? Has anybody been to the Arboretum at this point? OK, you should. You know there's that big hole in the ground? That big hole in the ground is a combination of forces. Part of it is glaciation, and part of it is recent stream redistribution. OK, basically that big hole in the ground is cutting into the lake bottom. OK? All right, questions? I've got homework up here. This is more sort of inspiration type of stuff. I've got a couple links up here. I want you guys to go to the web. I want you guys to take a look at some of these photos, some of the photos that are out there. I've got a couple really kind of cool links here for you guys to take a look at. Basically, it's just a photo gallery. I want you to see what this landscape looks like, because this landscape that you're looking at in these slides is basically the landscape that was here 10 to 15,000 years ago. This is what the Finger Lakes looked like 10 to 15,000 years ago. OK? You cool? All right. I'm going to move this slide so you can get these on the PDF. OK? All right. Now. I want us to go back to the concept of soil, okay? Now, 
Starting Monday, you guys are going to go out to the field. I don't have much time, but we're going to start in on this next lecture. Um, starting Monday, you guys are going to be going out to the field, and you're going to be looking at this landscape. And we're going to be talking about this glacial history. We're going to be talking about the position on the landscape. But another thing that we're going to be looking at is actually the morphology, the, the, the shape of the soils that are been, have been formed on top of this landscape. Okay, So let's start talking about what you're going to be seeing. And the first thing, well, maybe not the first thing, but the first thing that most people see when they start digging in the soil is actually what they feel, not actually what they see. Okay, when you have a big soil cut or you're looking at the wall, you, the first thing that you see is colors. But usually the first thing they do is you feel what it feels like. Okay, does that make sense? I mean, when you guys start playing with soil, you're sort of feeling it, right? Yeah, sometimes you're looking at it, but you're really sort of feeling it. Okay, and that feel comes from basically this half of the soil. Okay, remember me talking about this. I want you to think of soils as a volume. Okay, and an idealized soil, basically, let me put this to, you have to look at the holes. In an idealized soil, basically 50% of this material is solid material and 50% of it is void. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about this solid and we're going to focus mostly on the mineral component. Okay, that mineral component is that stuff that you feel. That organic component is that stuff that you feel. And they have very distinct feel. Certainly, you guys, when you guys were in kindergarten or grade school and you made, went to art class and made pots, and pinch pots and things like that, you know what the feel of clay is, right? That sort of sticky, smooth type of feeling. Okay? You also know the feeling of sand, right? Sort of that gritty, I mean, sandpaper, the grit. You go to the beach, you can feel it. Under. It's got a very distinct feel, right? Okay, well, what we're going to do today is we're going to sort of talk, we're going to start talking about it, and we'll finish it up on Monday. We're going to start talking about this. And when we start talking about it, we're really going to start talking about particle size. What is it that's in this material? Okay, and when we start talking about particle size, we're really talking about coarse materials moving into more finer material. Okay, so if you have a volume of material, you can certainly imagine there are boulders in there. And from boulders, you can go to gravel or large rocks, and then you can go to sand size materials, and then you can move to silty type of materials, smaller, and then ultimately you're gonna get to really small stuff, which is clay. Does that make sense? And we've sort of separated that out, okay? So we have coarse fragments. Basically, we consider coarse fragments anything larger than two millimeters, and that's the boulders, the gravel, and then anything that's smaller than that we call the fine earth fraction. And there is a reason why we break these things out, okay? If you think about a volume of material, and you think about the size of the material that's in that volume, you can certainly imagine the smaller and smaller and smaller the particle is, the more that particles that make up that volume, the more and more surface area you have in that volume. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So here I have a cube, basically an eight centimeter cube, okay? And it's made up of one material. It's just one solid piece. Now if I take that cube and start cutting it up, the volume isn't changing, but the surface area is, right? Now do you guys remember me on the very first lecture talking about, I don't have that slide at the moment, me talking about the spheres? and about the interface, soil's interface of the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the biosphere, and the atmosphere, okay? The more surface area you have, the more interface you have. It's that edge effect, right? So it turns out that why we think that two millimeters is the most important break is that's the point at which the surface area becomes large enough that it has a stronger influence on that dynamic, okay? I have a piece of gravel. Yes, I'm going to have interactions between the gravel and the larger world. But if I have a same size gravel, but I have the same volume as that piece of gravel, but it's sand, you can imagine how much larger that interface is with the world around it. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's why we have this break at two millimeters. Now, there's a lot of technical jargon that goes with it, but basically, there's a lot of different standards. But you'll note that depending upon what standard it is, they all sort of have this break at two millimeters. 
It doesn't matter whether the USDA, you're the British standards, or the, you're the engineering people. It's always at two millimeters. Basically, all of these groups sort of agree that this is the point at which you're having more interaction because of that surface area interface. OK? Now, that's the first thing I want to sort of convey. The second thing I want to convey is once we start talking about these finer particles, once we start talking about these sand, silt, and clay particles, yes, we are talking about the size of the material. But we're also talking about something else. Generally, the sand size particles are roundish. Let me have it represented up there like a beach ball. Okay? Sand is that larger segment. Okay? As you get down, you start moving into silt. And the breaks, here, let me put it back up here. So sand basically goes down, whoops, starts down from here, from two millimeters down to 0.05 millimeters. And we got a different grades of sand, but basically from 2 millimeters to 0.05 millimeters, it's sand. From 0.05 to 2 microns, it's silt. <coughs> and anything smaller than 2 microns <coughs> is basically clay. Now, that's the size differentiation. <coughs> but it turns out that there's also a shape differentiation. And this is really important as well, not just the size. The sands are round, but it turns out that the silts and clays are more disc-like. They're flat. They're platy. Now, that is going to dramatically influence how that arrangement of volume is made. Okay? Imagine I have round objects. Okay? They're going to pack a certain way. Does that make sense? Okay. They can pack sort of well sorted. They can pack tightly packed. Yeah, but they can pack. But they're guaranteed that there's going to be holes and cracks in them. It's guaranteed because the way they pack. But if I start packing flat things together, what's going to happen to these spots in here? Any thoughts? It's going to dramatically decrease for the same amount of material that's in that volume. OK? So if I start packing, I've got balls. Up. Imagine I've got a can and I'm throwing ping pong balls in them. OK? Imagine I have that same can and I'm throwing dimes in them. OK? The size and the amount of those pores are going to be dramatically different. OK? And the arrangement of them, how the pathways are between those pores. So let's go back to this slide. OK? This slide sh sort of gives you an idea about the shapes of them and the relative sizes. This is a sand size silt clay. OK? Better way to sort of remember it is basically you're looking at a beach ball, a frisbee, and a dime. OK? That's the relative size and the relative shapes. Now, you can certainly imagine that if I'm in a soil, it's not going to be just pure one thing. OK? These sand, silts, and clays, we basically call these soil separates. Separate particles, separate grades of size. But you get out into the real world, and you're certainly going to imagine that you have mixes of materials. Right? These mixes of materials basically make up different soil textures. Has everybody heard the term texture? So this is when we start talking, well, it's a sandy texture, or a loamy texture, or a silty texture. OK? And this is where we're going to start talking on Monday. OK? Questions? <coughs> OK, I want to remind you guys one more time, and we'll have to deal with this on Monday and Tuesday. But if you can, in the goodness of your heart, if you can switch from Monday to another lab, or Tuesday to Wednesday and Thursday, we're really looking for people to move into the Wednesday, Thursday labs. We're not going to kick anybody out, but we are going to have to deal with vehicles. If you can, please. All right, guys, be free. Have a great weekend.